let's perhaps go on to our next speaker, um, who, who is Michael Hansen, who's going to be talking about the connected imaging instrument. Michael. Yep, thank you. Can you guys see my slides okay? Okay, great. So uh, thanks very much for the uh, opportunity to come and speak here today. We're gonna take a small break from the machine learning uh, here. Uh, I, I'll skip over the stuff that we do on that because there's plenty of other stuff like that in this session. So I'm gonna focus a little bit on uh, doing remote reconstruction, remote processing of your data and why open reconstruction systems and open interfaces can really help you drive some uh, performance and, and drive new applications. Before I uh, dive into that, though, I have to say I'm an employee and shareholder of Microsoft, so keep that in mind as I go through my slides here. So I have uh, been involved in this area for, for quite some time, uh, working on making remote systems, remote processing systems for, uh, for MRI systems and for other kinds of medical instruments. And, you know, underlying this, uh, this effort has always been this question, what if imaging systems were connected to unbounded computational resources? What could we do? And so this uh, question has always fascinated me. And the one way to think about it, and, and I'll admit this is like a super simplified model of the world that I have, is that when we think about all the great stuff that we read, papers in the literature and so on, there is, um, it's not all of it that we can actually apply clinically. And the way that I think about what we can actually deliver to patient, patients or what I would call the, the solution space here, is that it's limited again in the simplified model by sort of three different things. So what you can do with your instrument, your gradient speed and so on, what the patient is willing to tolerate, how long can they lie still, how long can they hold their breath for and so on. But then there's another limitation that we can actually do something about and that's our compute capability. So if for instance, we had unbounded compute capabilities then we could maybe deliver more applications. And I think we all can think of some applications that are like that. So for a while, uh, we have, many of us were up against like trading off uh, imaging speed for Im imaging quality, or you know how uh, quantitative my method is maybe uh, compared to the speed or how much data I have to acquire. But we're also aware that I can actually shift this. And there's been several techniques over the years that have shown us that, you know, compressive sensing and other things that have shown that actually you can do with a lot less data under some conditions if you have enough compute power. And then, of course, the question then becomes, well, how do I get this compute power to the instrument? And sort of the initial urge is to stick this right on the scanner, but it, you very quickly get into some territory where you need a lot of compute uh, deployed with your imaging instrument, and it's actually not very effective. So there are times when you need lots and lots of compute when you're doing your imaging instruments, right? When you're, well, when you're doing your imaging experiment, right? When you're doing your image reconstruction. But over the lifetime of these instruments, the average duty cycle is actually very, very low. So it's a very ineffective way uh, of, of deploying this compute. And so it sort of has always been there somehow that we should probably put the stuff somewhere else where we can put the stuff that we need when we need it, maybe share it amongst mul multiple instruments. And this is sort of the underlying um, uh, you know, promise of, of, of what we're pursuing. So as I said, this is something that I've been thinking about and working on for a while. So I'm going to date myself here. Here's a paper from back in 2008 that uh, Thomas and I did on uh, taking the non-uniform Fourier transform and sticking it on GPUs. So mind you, this was back when uh, uh, general purpose computation on the GPUs was not so common. So it was a little bit of a struggle to do this, but it was worth it because we got like a hundred fold increase uh, in speed or almost a hundred fold increase in speed <clears throat> on this non cartesian for a transform, which now meant that we could do not only real time imaging, but we could also reconstruct the images in real time or almost in real time. And I apologize for the quality of this uh, video here, but it is authentic. It is really from back in the day. And um, this was amazing to us. And I remember being so excited. I called up some friends at Siemens at the time and I said, listen, friends, I've been to the future and I've seen how it's gonna work out. And uh, we must have GPUs in all these MRI scanners. And, and you can imagine that did not go over so well. And, uh, and it very quickly became apparent to me that it was gonna take a long, long time to get this onto MRI scanners. And so we quickly started thinking about, well, how can we access this technology anyway? And that was when we started working on this idea of connected imaging instruments. So we built 
I built some prototypes while I was at Great Ormond Street Hospital. There was efforts at the NIH, uh, the RTMRI system by Mike Gottman. There were several others. So I didn't, this is not an exhaustive list. There were many little efforts uh, bubbling up uh, along, these, um, along these lines. And after a little while, we actually put together something that was a, a sort of framework. Uh, and it was called the Gadgetron. It's still alive and well. It's on GitHub. I, I, I'd encourage you to participate in this project if you're interested. Um, so what we did here was we, we got some emails and other things from people that wanted, for instance, our non cotesian for a transform, but we also needed a way to connect this to a scanner. And so we put these things together, the connectivity and the toolboxes, and, and put this out as a, as a framework in open source. And you can Notice the date here on this paper. This is 2013, and it's not because it took me five years to write this paper. This is, this is actually because it took a very, very long time to get it published. So the world has changed a little bit, and I think this workshop uh, conference is, is an example of how much interest there actually is in, in reproducible research and, and open systems now. But back then, this was not so exciting, and it was nearly unpublishable. But we did manage to sort of uh, uh, squeeze it out. So if some of you have this... Uh, kind of stuff here. Don't hold back. Make sure that you you get it published and get credit for it and, and put your stuff out there. But this Gadgetron system was actually this very simple. What it is is the, it is a set of modules that you would put on uh, and and your your vendor's uh, reconstruction system. And instead of using the vendor's reconstruction system, you just send the data out over uh, over a TCP/IP connection, and then you have this external system out here. And so there are two important things about this framework. First of all, the data goes out, but the images come back in again. This was like a pivotal thing. It sounds, it sounds silly now, but this was super important because that meant that you could hook this up to a scanner and somebody, a tech, could operate this scanner and use whatever brand new technology you had, and it was completely transparent. They never knew the data left. This was a critical, critical thing. So this means that you can now start integrating this into the clinical workflow. The images come back onto the scanner, they go onto the packs, so on and so forth. This is really important in terms of being able to use this. The other thing that's important, of course, is that this is now an external system where you have a bunch of, of different, this is also a modular pipeline. There's nothing fancy about that, but you can pick whatever hardware you want, but also whatever software you want, which you know definitely now in the area of, era of machine learning and other things, it's really critically important to be able to deploy the models and other things that you have using the tools uh, that you're familiar with and, and, and that support your application. And they're often not supported on your vendor's uh, image reconstruction platform. So these two little things, the fact that the data comes back and that you can choose whatever platform you want was really important. And then there was a third thing that become, became really important in this work, and that was open standards for the data. So it became obvious quite quickly that if we wanted to share these kinds of image reconstruction frameworks uh, and, and have truly reproducible research, it only made sense if we agreed on what the data uh, actually looked like, right? So in a very important concept, when you put your reconstruction somewhere else that you're communicating with, this, the data format is now your contract. This is how these systems speak to each other. And this is critically important. So there's this ISMRM raw data project, which is also on GitHub and very much alive and well too, that I would like to invite anybody who, who wants to participate and roll up their sleeves and write some code, come participate in this. It's not always fun and games, but it's really important. And, and it's a good way to meet some other people in the field. But the basic concept here is that you take your data from your vendor platform, you convert it, use a vendor specific data conversion layer, which can either run in line as you acquire your data, or it could be an offline process, a command line tool. And now you have your data in a, in a vendor agnostic form, and then you run a generic reconstruction, which is not always totally generic. Sometimes these abstractions you know, bleed through a little bit, right? But, uh, but in principle, you now have some data that you can share and you have a reconstruction that you can share. A cool thing that we did with this also was that the paper we wrote about this was completely open source too. We put the manuscript on GitHub. There's a script for generating all the figures you can stick your own data in instead. You can look at all the scripts, how we window level the figures. Every single thing that's done in this paper is completely reproducible, right? And, the, and you can typeset the manuscript yourself. Of course, we also managed to, to get it published, but it was actually really cool. And, and I think for this workshop to sort of call this out that, you know, it's, this is now five years ago, I guess this paper came out, but still, uh, the, 
writing papers this way and sharing things this way was really uh, neat and important, I think an important part of the process. So this is a little bit of a history uh, lesson, if you will, uh, of, of some of the things uh, that, that we've worked on in the past here. And this work continues and I'll get back to sort of where we're heading with this. But I wanted to call out a few applications that have used this to like great success. And this presentation will not be complete without mentioning uh, Peter Kelman and Hui Shui at, at, um, at the NIH who have used the Gadgetron in this whole framework um, for lots of different applications. But one of the things that really driven is myocardial perfusion, where you know you inject contrast agent and stress agent, and then you see where the uptake of the contrast is low. Assessing this visually is time consuming and subjective. So what you actually want is to, you want something that's quantitative. You want something that's easy to uh, assess. You want a map where you can see the heart and where and and have the blood flow be in in you know milliliters of blood per gram of tissue per minute it has to be quantitative right this sounds easy but it's actually not that easy there are many processing steps in this right you have the motion correct you have to uh you know, surface coil correct there are a number of other corrections that are done here then there's modeling uh to to get all the uh, blood flow numbers out and so on you know, you can say each of these things are maybe not that hard, but they all have to be put together and having the freedom to develop this in an open platform has really helped drive this application for them. So they've now stuck this on the scanner. Uh, they've also done it in the cloud. And uh, because they have it in their own software framework where they can control everything, they can provide reporting, uh, you know, segmentation of the images and all these other things uh, because they have the freedom to, to, uh, to develop the software the way that they want. So here's just, this is a slightly sped up movie um, example of doing this on the scanner. So you can see this goes out to a Gadgetron box that's sitting somewhere else. All this comes back on the scanner and you, you can use this in a clinical workflow like you would anything else. This application would not have been driven this fast if it wasn't um, because of this open framework that they, they were working in. So important thing here, once you've made the step and said, well, I can put my reconstruction somewhere else, uh, then of course you could put this in the cloud. And this is where this now becomes really interesting, right? Cloud computing sort of grew up side by side with these efforts that we have. And this is where you can truly start thinking about things that at least for practical purposes are unbounded in terms of computational resources. You can have lots and lots of compute available to process your raw data if you can get it uh, to, to, uh, to, if you can get the data to where the compute is. Whether you can actually write the software that takes advantage of all of this is a different matter, right? That's a skill on its own, but at least you have that, uh, that opportunity. And, and of course the initial reaction to this is, well, you know, it's not fast enough. We can't get the data there, but this is not science fiction at all. I hope you can see this movie. This was recorded back in, in 2016. So it's five years old. We're, scanning in real time, doing cardiac imaging interactively in real time, changing acceleration factors. This is, you know, Cartesian parallel imaging, but we're dynamically changing the acceleration factor. We're updating coil sensitivity maps and interacting with the scan. And it is quite interactive, even though the data is being reconstructed in a data center somewhere in the cloud. So this is quite possible. I'll acknowledge it's not possible everywhere and it's not without problems, but it's not science fiction. We're, we're pretty close. And so what we need to do is a little bit of engineering to make this a little bit better. And, and we're working on some of that. But again, coming back to uh, Kui, he actually took this uh, to the next level by saying, well, when we put the data in the cloud, then we can use all this compute. And there's a super simple application that really il illustrates this. I always uh, bring it along here, but so cardiac function, uh, MR is the gold standard for that, right? But uh, we also know that many patients, especially patients with heart disease, are not that good at holding their breath. So oftentimes you have uh, respiratory artifacts uh, of various kinds and, and often poor image quality as a result of that. If we're talking about children, they have to be anesthetized and so on. This has been recognized for years. And there's been a number of algorithms to try and address this by taking data over many, many heartbeats or, many, or a series of heartbeats and then doing some kind of um, registration, getting deformation maps out and including those into the reconstruction. There's been different algorithms for it. They all have different qualities and so on. I'm not gonna uh, sort of dive into that in detail. This is a figure from a paper I wrote at some point, but there are other algorithms for it, 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 it too. And what's cool about this is if you do this, you can actually get image quality that's like a breath hold, but while free breathing. And for kids, this is great. 
right? This now makes the difference between anesthesia and not anesthesia. So this is, this is pretty amazing. What's not so amazing is now that it takes a couple of minutes to reconstruct each slice here. And so you can say, well, a couple of minutes is not a big deal, but it is a big deal if you only have one box sitting there next to your scanner. And now after 12 slices, you're 24 minutes in, the, uh, in debt reconstruction wise. That changes it from something that's not a clinical application to something that's more researchy and maybe not so easy to use, right? But if you can stream it to the cloud like we did, then you can, um, you can get the images back on the scanner within a minute or two and actually make this into a nice clinical application. So the, the, this idea of streaming this data to the cloud is really uh, something that I think will drive some of these applications forward. I wanna just say a, a little bit about the cloud. Uh, there are different kinds of clouds. They're all good. Uh, so you don't have to feel like you have to use a specific one or anything like that. You don't even have to use a commercial public cloud like uh, you know Amazon or Google or Microsoft or any of those. You can build your own cloud in your own data center. It is just fine. It is a little bit of maintenance, but if that's what you prefer, it's still a cloud. You can call it a cloud. It's, it's, it's all good. What most people talk about when they talk about cloud is infrastructure as, serve, as a service, right? You rent a virtual machine from some cloud vendor and then you put some software on it. That's also good. But if you're getting into this right now, I would call out that now most of the big cloud vendors have a very nice platform as a service offering. So you can get a Kubernetes cluster that is fully managed for you. Control plane is taken care of. Somebody patches your nodes for you. You don't have to be an IT expert to do this stuff. And then you can have a cluster and run it like a, like a boss. If you're going to get into this now, that is what I would recommend that you do because this, this, there's some pain over here that I have gone through over the years. Uh, and you, you're welcome to reach out if you want some, some advice or, or anything. I'm happy to help with it. What we did do was we, we have a little repository here uh, on the Microsoft uh, GitHub organization, which has Helm charts, if you know what that is, but sort of scripting and things to run the Gadgetron in a distributed way in a Kubernetes cluster. It's, a, it's called Gadgetron Azure, but it really works on any Kubernetes cluster. So where it scales up and down automatically, nodes come and go and all of this sort of stuff. This can be a little bit tricky to set up on your own. So we provide some scripts for that. So if you're interested in that, um, uh, go, go uh, check out this repo. I'm going to speed up here a little bit. I want to say we're sort of, this is all starting to come together now. Um, we have a, a small collaboration with Case Western and Siemens and us where Siemens is now providing a the, mo the module for sending out the data as a works in progress package. You can run your reconstruction again in a managed framework. And then Case Western took 3D fingerprinting and put into this fr framework and they can now test it on multiple sites and do a bunch of different things. So it's starting to get to a point where it's actually not so hard to do. And if you wanna learn more about that, do feel free to uh, reach out to me. Um, just one quick note on what's next here. Uh, it sounds like it's all working, but when we're honest about it, this is pretty brittle. Uh, so for instance, if this connection breaks, even for a short period of time, it actually doesn't turn out so well. Typically your reconstruction fails and so on. So what we're working on is kind of the next generation of this stuff where you have some compute in the cloud, you have some compute on the edge, you have intelligent buffering and you have resilient connections so that your scanner can come and go without things falling apart. So there's a lot of engineering still to do, but I think um, you know, in the future, we will start seeing these things becoming uh, more available to lots of different sites and you can think more about just deploying your, your application. So that just wanna sum up and say, um, a lot of this work that we've done has really been driven by the community and uh, all the community involvement. We now need to do a little bit of engineering to make it a slightly more grown up and resilient, but we're getting there. And if you're interested in any of this work, uh, do reach out. There's always a uh, need for more people to help out. So with that, thank you for your attention. I'll take any questions maybe afterwards um, or, or if there's time now. Thank you.